we, we thank everyone for joining us and we'll start in one moment. We just uh, want to give everyone a chance to, to join us and um, we will get this program started. I guess I would just uh, remind people that this is part of a series, uh, webinar series on climate change and communities and that this uh, series will have another talk on November 18th and that will be at 1 p.m. It will be on building back better, but in a small and hurricane damaged economy. Dominica's quest to be the world's first resilient nation. So please join us for that one. There are several more talks planned in this series. They are available at the Center for uh, Environmental Policy website at American University. And again, thank you for joining us. We have a very uh, uh, accomplished group of panelists today. Uh, I will introduce now, please, Dr. David Simpson, who is an environmental and resource economist. He is the head of the International Economic Relations and International Development Program uh, at the School of International Service at American University, as well as uh, a former uh, uh, official at the Environmental Protection Agency of the US government and at, with extensive experience also in nonprofit organizations such as Resources for the Future. It is a great pleasure and many thanks to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Simpson. Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, Professor Eisenstadt said, uh, I am an environmental and resource economist uh, who does a fair bit of his work in developing countries. So this is a topic of great interest to me uh, to, and I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to participate. I'm next going to introduce each of our speakers. Um, I'll, I will introduce each right before they speak. So our first speaker is Dr. Tafik Huck. He's the chair of Department of Political Science and Sociology of North South University in Dhaka, Bangladesh, and director of the South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance. He's taught in Norway, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal, and publishes extensively, including several books and, and multiple book chapters and articles in the fields of administrative culture, models of governance, climate change, NGO accountability, local social society, globalization, and geopolitics. He's directed several national surveys in Bangladesh and South Asia, including one on climate change vul vulnerability in 2019. So Dr. Huck, if I could ask you to uh, make your presentation, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh... Dr. David, uh, I welcome everyone, the participants and also the panelists to this presentation. I especially thanks to my very good friend, Dr. Todd Eisenstadt. Uh, uh, we have been working in this uh, climate change related uh, survey and research project for last uh, few years. And we're trying to develop also some of the uh, articles and uh, academic papers on the basis of the survey that we have been conducted. And today's presentation, my presentation is basically based on the survey that we completed in 2019. I will show, uh, start with a, uh, just a uh, kind of a PowerPoint presentation, but very quickly I will go because uh, uh, probably we don't have uh, enough time to go in details of this uh, uh, survey and the papers that we are developing on the basis of the survey. So uh, I just wanted to let you know about, uh, okay, so the screen is shared. Can all of you see it, uh, David? Yes, looks good, thank you. Okay, so this, uh, my presentation is basically based on a draft paper on uh, polycentrism and the adaptation paradox and over where the climate vulnerable can access uh, uh, this. So I will be uh, going very quickly with this uh, introduction and some of the methodological part. I mostly will be focusing on uh, these uh, findings of the survey. So the major uh, research question was the how do people on the ground attribute responsibility for taking action to combat the dangerous impact of climate change? 
and also that uh, the survey covered 3,494 climate vulnerable Bangladeshi citizens, and we asked basically two aspects of responsibility attribution: who got us here, uh, who is responsible for this climate change situation, and who needs to take the responsibility to fix it. Is it the local government, is it the national government, or the international organizations and the international organizations? So we have uh, kept some uh, debates on this uh, uh, research that adaptation paradox, well, climate change is a global risk, variability to it is locally experienced, as we are most seeing. And international cooperation regarding climate change mitigation is failing and greater pressure on uh, subnational actors. So the positioning of higher uh, on these developing countries' uh, uh, shoulder. I'm not going in discussion of polycentric governance and accountability is a theoretical conceptual discussion here. Uh, if needed, we'll come back to this uh, question and segment. So if we just, because we do understand here, uh, there are probably attendees and the participants who uh, probably have do not have a clear idea about the risk factors in Bangladesh. So if you just summarize the overall climate change risk factors in Bangladesh, you would think that there are several attributes or uh, characteristics of Bangladesh in terms of its uh, climate vulnerability. So it's a low-lying terrain, geographical propensity for cyclones, post coastal surges, river flooding, and drought are there, and encroaching salinity is also becoming gradually a big factor. So in terms of its uh, uh, sensitivity on, uh, towards climate change, it's almost 20% of GDP. So biological vulnerability is, in, is transforming into economic vulnerability. And for many households, migration is the one possible feasible uh, option for this uh, as a disaster. What government is doing? Government is uh, an international engagement uh, covering with uh, several projects. We, uh, we have this uh, climate change trust fund project. We have this uh, climate change resilience project, which is being funded by World Bank. Another project that I was talking, it was funded by the government itself. So it's like a four, 465 million funding and managed by national government, World Bank, NGO, and it's spent on climate adaptation since 2000. And then there are less national level climate programs, the comparatively strong and also the kind of a uh, climate action plan is there, but the major issue is basically corruption at the national level, uh, managing these climate uh, uh, change projects and also the local level. And local governments have few resources and little power also. So that's the background and the context. If we come to the survey specific kind of uh, structure, we'll be fine. As I said, that there were 3,494 respondents being interviewed from June to September 2019. The primary sampling unit was rural union councils and then suburban municipality city corporation. The secondary survey uh, sampling unit was rural villages, suburban and urban wards, and tertiary was family houses. So it was basically a household survey at the end. What kind of questions did we ask? We basically tried to understand that uh, differentiation between the government's levels, whether the citizens they can differentiate the responsibility and the role of the governments at the local, national, international level or not. So we asked this question as I, at the beginning, I said, who is responsible for climate change? Who must try to solve this? Overall, is the government doing a good job at the both local and national level? Overall level of trust of institution at all levels? So in general, we found that uh, don't differentiate that people do not differentiate between levels of government when attributing responsibility. I shall come back to that part at the later stage also. So in terms of the citizens' perception about uh, efficacy, we ask these questions like, has there been more flooding and sunburns where you live in last five years to understand the background and the context? Have you sought assistance from officials in the last 12 months? Do you think your representative or mayor listens to people like you? And finally, how much trust do you have in following groups and institutions? So these are the major questions we try to understand and we try to find out. So if I, if I show you some of the major findings, because as I said that this was a quite a comprehensive national level survey covered all <clears throat> region of Bangladesh and uh, very interesting findings were there, but I'm just uh, giving you some glimpses here. 
So fewer than 30% heard of climate adaptation or mitigation. And 73% thought these two concepts are basically the same. Yeah. So people cannot differentiate between adaptation and mitigation, and that's understandable. Uh, for them, mitigation, which is invisible anyway, is that something happening somewhere else. So some, somewhere else in the world, people are emitting uh, CO2 or greenhouse gas, and then because of that, uh, floods is happening in Bangladesh, they cannot relate those things, and that's also natural. 90% had heard local officials discuss natural disasters, and 12% had received disaster aid in last five years. So if we just again come to this uh, distinction issues that uh, uh, mitigation and adaptation kind of the debate, so I, here I quoted one of the respondents uh, from his qualitative interview, the climate change affected population in Bangladesh are more concerned about short and medium term interventions as well as visible solutions by the government like infrastructural things. And they are least concerned about the long-term mitigation issues like greenhouse gas and And I'm sure that's the reality in many of the developing countries in the world. Again, we, if we see some of the numbers, 80% noticed changes in seasons over previous five years, 46% became personally injured or ill as a result of a climate change related event. 33% know someone who experienced crop loss or failure. 12% were forced to temporarily leave their homes as a result of these events. 23% called disaster relief ineffective. All the related infrastructure also ineffective. And 73% were aware of disaster prevention. We had uh, in this uh, draft paper that uh, Todd, I, and uh, other colleagues are uh, trying to develop that uh, four hypotheses. The first one is the higher perceived environmental vulnerability the less likely the respondent is to seek action from the three levels of government for climate change. The second one is the higher respondents believe in religious attribution of climate change, the less likely the response is to seek action from the three levels of government for climate change. So if people think that this is a, a kind of a fatalistic thing that the climate change things are happening or floods are coming, probably they will uh, not to make a government accountable. The greater, the third uh, hypothesis is the greater respondents believe in the efficacy of the local government, the more likely the respondents to seek action from the three levels of government for climate change. And the last one is regarding trust. If they have a greater trust in the in institutions, probably they will like uh, likely the respondents to seek action from the three levels of government. So we tested these uh, four hypotheses. Uh, quantitatively, I'm not going into the detailed numbers, but uh, if we show the, res uh, show the result, the hypothesis one, proof and accurate, especially regarding to the question concerning flooding. Hypothesis uh, two, also proof and accurate, those who believe human caused uh, climate change are more likely to seek government action, who believe that this is the act of God, they think that, okay, I can depend on whatever will be happening, will happen. And hypothesis three is basically no discernible association was been found. And in terms of the efficacy of the government uh, institutions. And the last one also has been uh, uh, proven like more trust in local government means less desire for central government intervention on climate change. If I come to the now the general uh, concluding results that respondents, they did not tend to differentiate, as we already mentioned that between levels of government, especially regarding blame of, for climate change and the need to solve it. So they cannot differentiate between local, national, and international. In general, more trust in local government is associated with less interest, less interest in national government action on climate change. However, the trust in uh, security forces is also correlated with interest in government action for climate change. There were higher level of the trust in on the security forces. And respondents tended to praise local and criticize national government, even when confronted with corruption at the local level. And that's a quite a little bit paradox, and we tried to explain it and I'll come back at the, for the last slide. So if we now see that uh, the research supports a lack of differentiation by respondents regarding what government should be doing about climate change. So 
but inclination toward government action is traceable to also individual factors, for example, previous experiences. But the paradox is the trust in local government and there is less interest in national government action for climate change. And why it is happening, we'll try to explain it a little bit later on. Uh, so these are the concluding things that uh, I think I already covered it. But now if we want to understand that why people have this kind of a overall. So I want, before I conclude, I want to show you some pictures. I'm sure that uh, it probably among our, our South Asian participants or the North American participants, you have seen this kind of the pictures and many times before, whether this is in case of India or in Bangladesh, the natural disaster pictures published in the international newspapers or CNN, BBC, these are the very common pictures. They're during the flood, people are moving with their belongings, children in their hand. And then also you'll be seeing these are the, some of the pictures where these, uh, these houses have been submerged under the water and uh, some other uh, you know, stuff. And also a bird's eye view that how it looks like when a village submerged with uh, flood water. And this is a kind of a infrastructure like a uh, relief center. Uh, or also a kind of infrastructural kind of support. Uh, but what we I wanted to show you here by showing this picture is one of the reasons that uh, we could not find a direct very uh, relationship of people's uh, accountability mechanism to the central government is one probably the reason is uh, these people in Bangladesh or India or many of the South Asian parts they are living with flood or they are living with natural disaster for thousands of years. Or not something new. I'm sure that for our European or American uh, viewers, these are something very, very kind of a alarming pictures. But if you ask any Bangladeshi people or Indian people, they're used to by seeing this thing. And the flood comes two times on average, sometimes three times in a year. And people think that the flood is part of their life. So they are living with flood. So thousands of years, they have learned the mechanism to live with the thousand years. And then they have more trust on the local government than the central government because the local government is a more visible participatory actor who come into their help during this natural And Bangladesh especially have done a good uh, job in terms of disaster management uh, for last few decades. So it's a quite surprising, even though there are lots of issues in terms of this governance problems, the corruption is there, is rampant in many parts of the government structure. But when it comes to natural disaster, it looks like that, it seems like all of a sudden the whole government structures at the local level, they become efficient and they become a little bit less corrupt. They try to help people because they need to get elected. And also these are the people who are relatives of, of them. So it is a quite, uh, uh, understandable from a, a societal and administrative uh, analytical point of view that and that's probably the reason that the people has trust on local government and they blame central government not giving enough relief or giving enough kind of the infrastructure of the city. I shall conclude my uh, speech at this point of the time by saying that if you look into the history of flood in Bangladesh, uh, you can go back as I said that thousands of years back. And it's been happening. And but if you see the also some of the progress that Bangladesh has had in the uh, last few decades, that uh, you all know that Bangladesh having 160 million people, but also having a very small piece of land. So the size of Bangladesh is like Georgia, yes. But uh, Bangladesh has uh, like 16 times more population than Georgia. And uh, this country, when it got independent in 1971, it has only 70 million people. And at that time, we had a severe shortage of uh, uh, food and agricultural production. Now, Bangladesh has become almost food is still sufficient, even though it is having regular flood, it's still having some natural disasters. So there are some connections that probably some level the local government or some other organizations or maybe NGOs, they are working and that's why people are uh, still having a better uh, kind of a uh, disaster management at the local level. And the success of disaster management of Bangladesh in local level is uh, uh, is uh, admitted by the many of the international organizations. There needs to be more research being done, why it could be happened where 
the whole administration at the central and mid level also having lots of problem of corruption and inefficiency. We can look into that matter in a more detailed manner. But my uh, Dr. Huck, to... um, thank you very much. Um, yeah. A very interesting presentation, but thank you. Thank are you, uh, running a little short on time. So I'm sure we'll have many questions for Dr. Huck uh, yeah. in the discussion period. But let me uh, move on to the next speaker, who is Sharaban Tahura Zaman. Uh, Ms. Saman is an environmental lawyer and academic based in Bangladesh, and she works to promote environmental and climate justice. Currently, she's serving as a full-time environmental law lecturer at the Department of Law and Department of Environmental Science and Management at the North South University in Dhaka. And she's also a senior research fellow with the Center for Climate Justice in Bangladesh. Ms. Saman is also a scholar and Bangladesh government delegate to the UN climate negotiations on issues of compliance and mitigation, and currently, she's serving as a legal advisor of the LDC Group to the Paris Agreement Compliance Committee. So, Ms. Saman, if you could make your presentation, please. Um, thank you, David. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunities. Uh, and thanks, Dr. Hawk, for um, uh, making the uh, groundwork and sharing also the people's perception. I I'll try to give my presentation more from the perspective of uh, legal structure and from the legal uh, framework that exists in Bangladesh uh, on the matter of flood regulation issues. Um, and also, um, I will try to uh, give a reflection in the matter of accountability and uh, transparency issue and what stage right now in, the, uh, in terms of legal and policy framework we are standing here to, uh, to make the government more accountable. So um, before jump into the more detailed discussion, I would like to flag up the issues. Uh, flood is something, uh, is a phenomena in Bangladesh that uh, we can consider it from a different perspective. Like as Dr. Hawk said, like it is, uh, Bangladesh is a low lying country and flood, especially at the monsoon season, season flood is a very common phenomena. So this is something that's uh, um, related with our geographical location. Now, there are two other different contexts as well from the climate change perspective. The one is adaptation that Dr. Hawk already referred. And um, I mean, uh, regulating uh, the uh, flood issues from the context of adaptation perspective by developing the capacity of the local community and by improving their resilience uh, so that is the one context. But another very important context that's very much relatable with Bangladesh perspective is considering or seeing the flood issue from the context of loss and damage. Because uh, as we might uh, all of know that under the Paris Agreement, besides mitigation and adaptation, loss and damage is the third recognized pillar. And as far the uh, widely accepted uh, understanding in the matter of loss and damage under the climate change. Uh, we consider loss and damage is a situation when mitigation fails and also adaptation also fails because it's no longer within the adaptive capacity of the community or uh, the government structure. And that is the time when loss and damage appears and where we can actually um, address the issues and it becomes a permanent loss where the only remedy might be compensation. So flood is something that actually covered these three angle uh, as a monsoon uh, regular disaster as from the adaptation perspective and also from the loss and damage perspective. Now let's have a look on the reality on the ground, uh, especially focusing on the existing scenario of our legal structure. So if we overall see uh, the flood regulating framework in Bangladesh, uh, though, uh, as I mentioned, uh, the flood uh, issue has a three different component uh, as a regular disaster from adaptation and also from loss and damage perspective. And interestingly, Bangladesh existing legal framework recognize all these three components. So we do address flood from a loss and damage perspective, from the adaptation perspective, and also from the uh, natural disaster or from the uh, regular disaster perspective as well. So this is where the complexity, legal or policy complexity arise actually. So in the current phenomena, if we specifically look at our current legal framework, uh, 
flood regulatory framework is more about uh, relief and response based measure. So uh, our existing framework is more focused on relief and response based issues in the matter of flood instead of considering it from the resilience perspective or from the loss and damage perspective. And another um, big challenge is lack of coordination between the flood regulatory framework and national climate change strategies. So in Bangladesh, we do have flood regulatory framework separately, like we have flood action plans, uh, flood regulatory strategy that we very recently adopted. At the same time, we do have climate change strategies separately, um, like Bangladesh has BCCP, SAP, uh, uh, um, we do have Disaster Management Act that acknowledge climate change issues. So these are the very two different things, and there is very lack of coordination between these two distinct separate regulatory framework. And at the same time, as I mentioned uh, before, um, this uh, regulatory framework, it doesn't matter, uh, we are uh, seeing it from the flood regulation perspective or from the climate uh, change strategy perspective, there is a, a lack of uh, focus to, uh, to build the adaptive capacity or resilience of the vulnerable community, especially. Because uh, in Bangladesh, um, we have some portion uh, which are more flood prone area. At the same time, they are more vulnerable due to the adverse impact of climate change. But from that context, a direct redress mechanism or direct response mechanism towards that community is clearly absent in our existing legal framework. The fourth um, biggest challenge here that uh, being a lawyer and a uh, climate, uh, sorry, uh, uh, law expert, uh, there is a, another big challenge that I see is the coordination complexity among the institution. I'm just giving you an example. Uh, in Bangladesh, uh, flood or any water related problem is mostly uh, seen or implemented, even if it, if it is a project or program also, if it is mostly actually regulated or implemented by Bangladesh Water Development Board. But at the same time, uh, from the climate change context, uh, this flood portfolio also goes under the Ministry of Environment, especially uh, the depart under the Department of Environment that belongs under the Ministry of Environment and Forest. And as I said, like we also within our national laws consider flood as an issue of loss and damage. Um, I mean, these things also goes under the portfolio of Ministry of Disaster and Relief. So, I mean, we, we, we got to see like there are so many project initiative programs are going on uh, in between these three different uh, ministries and institution, as I said, like Water Development Board, um, Ministry of Environment and Forest, and also uh, from Disaster, Ministry of Disaster and Relief. But there are no coordination, uh, and uh, none of them know actually what uh, projects or programs are they're implementing, um, and whether there is overlapping or not, uh, whether there, um, there should be some sort of strong linkage or not. I mean, these uh, ministries and institutions are so isolated from each other. Uh, that uh, it also creates lots of confusion uh, in the matter of institutional coordination and to actually uh, to uh, make an effective outcome out of this whole process. And also, as uh, Dr. Hawk referred, I mean, there is also a lack of people's participation. From legal perspective, if I see, uh, there is a scope because um, in the Local Government Act, we do have a clear specific Local Government Act that we adopted in 2009. And there is a clear provision for community and people's participation. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we do keep them uh, um, uh, participate, especially at the very beginning when we formulate the project or for, uh, I mean, especially at the beginning of the formulation of project or program. But later on, when uh, it comes the management of flood issues or um, uh, establishing the flood management committees that exist um, at our union Purishot level, uh, in that case, uh, we see very lack of participation of the local communities and um, uh, local people's participation. Now, from the government and awareness and transparency perspective, 
we do see uh, lots of suggestions, especially from the uh, legal and policy framework perspective. We do suggest uh, to develop a more evidence-based uh, flood policy formulation. We do suggest reconciliation of the interest of land, water, and people, because in the current uh, uh, framework, there is a clear gap of the reconciliation of the interest of land, water, and people. And also, um, we do suggest uh, communities' voice to be heard while uh, there is a decision-making process. They should be given the opportunity, especially the vulnerable community should be given the opportunities to participate um, when uh, the decision is actually taking. And also, uh, there is a very long demand uh, to fill up this existing gap in the matter of flood regulating process. But this is the suggested way forward that we are actually uh, advocating for very long time to the government. Unfortunately, uh, uh, nothing actually is effectively, nothing much is actually happening. Now the question is why? Why accountability is not developing uh, from the uh, government perspective? Is it something that doesn't exist within our legal framework? The answer is no, it do exist. As I said, like in our local government, um, under the Local Government Act, and also uh, especially under the climate change strategy and uh, regulatory framework, there do scope for the accountability perspective. So there, is, there do scope um, uh, where we can actually question the government and also government and all the developing agencies who are implementing different project and program in the matter of climate change or to address the flood problem. Uh, we do have scope for accountability. Government need to uh, publish um, their audit and also um, there should uh, needs to have uh, uh, sufficient uh, I mean, consultation program and all that uh, so that people can ask questions to the government and to its different institution and bodies. But the problem is people are really less aware on these issues. As Dr. Hawk rightly pointed out that uh, people, I mean, especially uh, the local community or the vulnerable group, they, they cannot actually relate uh, this flood problem with the issues of climate change and especially with the issue from the context of loss and damage and adaptation perspective. So people do have right to question here and to ask um, what is the output of this project or the program. But considering the lack of awareness from the people, uh, most of the time it never turn out in the way that it should be. Definitely there is a huge contribution from the corruption side as well. Uh, but people's lack of awareness is another very big challenge at the very grassroots level. So, um, for, for example, uh, under the Union Porishod um, Act 2009, uh, every month there should have a Union Porishod meeting, that meetings should take place by the leadership of the Union Porishod chairman, where all the community of that uh, union uh, should come and ask the question and at the same time, the local government will um, inform them what development uh, uh, program or project is currently going on. People don't know about that. So most of the time in this sort of meeting, we, we hardly see people are participating and making some constructive uh, question to the government. So here, um, from my perspective, what I see from our legal uh, avenue, we do have scope to make the government accountable and to make it more transparent process. But these tools will only be functional if we can make the local community more aware about their rights. In that case, I believe a strong educational system, uh, more advocacy and participation of the civil society will really help on these issues. If, uh, if we don't work much, uh, on the uh, on making the community aware about their right. I mean, this existing tool that we ex uh, that exists from 2009 to till today uh, is not going to function. So that's all from my side. Thanks for hearing. Thank you very much. And again, I'm sure we'll have a number of questions from the group, but let's hear from our last speaker before we begin to take questions from from the participants. And our last speaker is going to be Professor Teresa Kramars, sorry, uh, and she is Associate Professor in the Monk School of Global Affairs at the University of Toronto. 
and a senior research fellow of the Earth Systems Governments Research Alliance. She's co-director of the Accountability and Global Environmental Task, Task Force also. Her two, two recent books published by MIT Press are Global Environmental Governments and the Accountability Trap, which she co-edited with Susan Park, and Forgotten Values, the World Bank and Environmental Partnerships. In addition to her scholarship, she's, she has extensive experience working on environmental governance and policy issues, including climate, with international agencies, including the World Bank, the United Nations Development Program. So, Dr. Carvaris, please. Off mute. <laughs> sorry, I, sorry, I sorry I did that. I, I was um, I'm moving uh, windows around in my uh, in my um, desktop. Um, well, thanks thanks very much for the kind introduction and uh, introduction, and thank you uh, for this invitation to to this to this uh, great panel uh, to Todd and American University and, and to my fellow panelists for their contribution. Um, I will, uh, not being a Bangladesh scholar, I will uh, offer some, some comments, uh, some broader comments. And um, I do study uh, Latin America, so I will make so, uh, uh, I'll tell you an anecdote that I think might, might carry, might, um, might be comparable um, to some of the uh, issues that uh, we've been hearing so far. Uh, but I want to start by offering some comments on what vulnerability to fast events brought on by climate change looks like to those who are already experiencing the effects of slow violence. And by this, I mean the kind of violence that, that's not spectacular, but it accumulates slowly and over time, what Rob Nixon calls violence by accretion, and I would say amounts to um, death by a thousand cuts. So rapid onset environmental disasters um, are, are spectacles and they concentrate at least for a time the public's attention on a, on a dire event and when media coverage focuses on this events you know be they oil spills or floods uh, they often mask the causal chain of issues that underpin these uh, devas the devastating impact of, of a disaster and they privilege the visibility of these tipping points these causal chains are also discounted in everyday public discourse so, um, for example, that the health and environmental damage that comes from living next to a petrochemical compound where heavy metals permeate the water, the air, the soil of poor communities where garbage dumps or lack of sewage or access to clean water create chronic diseases is part of the everyday social vulnerability of uh, life in many communities that lies largely dormant when public debate and scholarly literature um, on building resilient societies, uh, avoid addressing root causes. Um, like the pandemic, like the COVID-19 pandemic, environmental disasters are often treated as singular and catastrophic events that capture everyone's attention. Um, and although these disasters have cascading effects, they're generally considered isolated and linear events. But the full force of disasters is actually unleashed by the underlying processes of poverty and inequality. So I want to refer to this concept of social vulnerability to highlight that being susceptible to shocks is actually socially constructed. It's a phenomenon influenced by institutional and economic dynamics, like Edgar and Kelly have, have noted. And it is a product of social and place-based inequalities, like Cutter and others have also noted. So I want to tell you about um, a, a small, a small anecdote, an experience, and a place in South America that illustrates this point. And I know we're discussing Bangladesh, but perhaps, as I said, there are some parallels and some shared conditions that help in in framing a broader discussion. Um, so in 2014, I was in Argentina, um, where I'm, I'm, I'm actually from, uh, with a large group of students from the University of Toronto. And I was teaching a course in environmental governance. And we had arranged interviews with several organizations in a community named Flammable, uh, Flammable in Spanish. This is uh, a shanty town that's hemmed in by a petrochemical compound and it's on the banks of the Riachuelo River, uh, which is part of a larger basin. Um, and, and early that morning, my students and I, instead of being at the community, we stood in the opposite shore and uh, blocked by firefighters. We were blocked from entering the community because a gas pipe had exploded in the, in the wee hours of the morning and immediately incinerated several houses. 
Now this barely made the radio news, um, in, so, so we actually all showed up to, to go to our interviews. Um, and it barely showed up in the news because in the long timeline of environmental tragedies that have, has affected this area and its inhabitants, in fact, since 1810, this didn't register as a newsworthy story. Uh, flammable receives its name because it's adjacent to a dock that's dedicated to flammable products. And that dock was built by the petro petrochemical companies that are in this area um, after a, a large ship that was harbored in a, in a canal nearby had caught fire and exploded. And I wanted to take students to this place in the middle of the city Buenos Aires, of, of Buenos Aires, which is one of the largest metropolis in the world with a population of 60 million to experience with governance failures and disinterest in the face of environmental contamination and the plight of the very poor and vulnerable population looks like in practice. The Riachuelo has a, a 200 year history of government mismanagement and it's regularly listed in among the 10 most polluted places on earth and it's right up there with Chernobyl and the entire basin covers a big expanse. It's 2200 square uh, kilometers. Five million people live around the banks of the rivers. About 40% of the population lacks as, access to water, 60% lacks as, access to proper sewage. And the largest sources of contamination are industrial effluents from about 15,000 industries that are mostly in petrochemical and pharmaceutical in, in uh, sectors. Um, so the soil and water and air and flammable uh, and well beyond flammable, of course, are contaminated with lead, with chromium, benzene. Children are regularly tested with very high levels of lead in blood. People suffer from many chronic conditions um, caused by living in this environment, you know, from skin rashes and respiratory problems to repeat miscarriages, cognitive impairments, cancer. Uh, so back to, to, to my story, given this fire, the students I'm there with uh, and I uh, end up different, uh, visiting different parts of the basin and were escorted by the firefighters who later then invite us to the fire hall. And they set up a circle of chairs to allow us to kind of make do makeshift interviews with various community organizations and neighborhood leaders. And among them is this woman, Beatriz Mendoza. Uh, Mendoza was the lead litigant in a historic court case against the national, provincial, municipal, city governments and the 44, in, and, and, and actually 44 industries, which were named in the, in the case, for health damages got, caused by contamination. And she became, she has become the public face, actually one of the most recognizable national symbols of the struggle of the poor to get the government to clean the basin. Um, in 2004, Mendoza was a social psychologist working in a community clinic in Flammable. Um, she and many neighbors were getting sick and um, her coworkers and her kept seeing um, clients in the health clinic with similar and recurrent illnesses. So after so many, years of failed government policies to stop the contamination, Mendoza and 17 neighbors filed a case with the Supreme Court of Argentina. There's a, there's a similar case in, um, in uh, Manila Bay as well. Um, and and, and some, um, some comparables to, to, um, uh, to in, in the Ganges, but, but, but I digress a little bit. Um, the, the outcome was that in two separate decisions, in 2006, 2008, the Supreme Court of Argentina decides to take on the case and manage a definitive solution, right? So this was huge news. The people of Riachuelo, immense optimism, and around the world, this case is hailed as a long-awaited victory. And this is you know, the advent of green courts and courts stepping in to solve um, what other political institutions uh, seem unable or unwilling to manage themselves. So uh, by this, I mean the legislative and executive branches. So the Supreme Court at the time enjoyed quite a bit of legitimacy. This was, this was just good news all around, right? However, <laughs> um, every July, the neighbors of Flammable and the many other communities that line the banks of this basin count another year, separating them from that historic moment of hope when people thought that their constitutional right to a healthy environment would finally be delivered to them. To date, the original claim for health damages has not advanced. The industries originally sued have not meant to pay. A court mandated rehabilitation plan for the basin continues to fail to meet its targets and timelines. So um, in light of these continuous failures from so many branches and multiple levels of governance, uh, government, um, Mendoza said to us that 
you know, we, we waited a long time for this case to be filed. We had high expectations, but to date we have not, we have seen that our health was affected and we have not had any accountability, any, any redress for this. Now, these days, Mendoza says she doesn't want to talk to the government anymore. In July 2019, during the last public hearing, which was convened by the, which is convened every year by the Supreme Court, she walked out in outrage. Um, these are uh, public hearings that are supposed to be accountability forum, and they're ordered by the court for public officials to present their progress and rehabilitate in the basin and respond to the questions from affected stakeholders. And Mendoza at this meeting said, I'm outraged. This meeting is a lie. In 11 years since the Supreme Court decision, the quality of life of the people here in the Riachuelo has not improved in any way. It's gotten worse. And I would say um, because uh, industrial contamination has increased and no one is controlling it, life is worse for everyone. Mendoza um, told government officials making their presentations during, during this fora that the problem with contamination is that it's an abstract idea to you and you can't see its consequences. So this is the kind of slow violence that I'm talking about, right? Until you get a flood like the one in La Plata where, um, and so many lives are lost. And she was referring to a massive flood in the nearby city uh, following a torrential rain where garbage had blocked drainage tubes. There's lack of adequate sewage infrastructure and poor city planning all combined with the effects of climate change are blamed for the effects of the worst hydro meteorological disaster in the history of Argentina. So this is another reason why the lives of the people in the Riachuelo continues to deteriorate. The effects of climate change are rapidly accelerating and being felt more frequently across the world. Um, the Riachuelo is one of the low-lying areas uh, most affected by, um, by uh, flooding in Argentina. The river that runs through the lower plains is experiencing a rise in frequency and intensity of floods, and they are projected to increase. Heat waves and levels of humidity are also rising, and this enables the propagation of vectors like mosquitoes uh, that cause dengue, vinchucas, uh, sorry, vinchucas that carry chagas. And since most of the affected shanty towns sit right on the ranks of the river. These populations are the first to deal with floods and heat waves uh, and the diseases and their immediate surroundings. So climate change is generating a tangible emergency for people who live there. Another neighbor who was at this meeting, Ramon Acosta, said between tears, yesterday it rained. The water came up to the edge of our house. We keep getting flooded because the infrastructure work in this nearby river is not getting done. You say the garbage dumps have been removed, but as I was coming here, I saw garbage every 50 meters. So he says to government, stop sending us tin sheets and mattresses whenever we get flooded, we need you to not abandon us. So the takeaway for me is, uh, as Jesse Rebo has argued as well, is it's, it is not the climate event that causes the catastrophe in poor communities. It's their pre-existing vulnerabilities and disempowerment from a democratic process. So people are not vulnerable to climate change events because they lack adaptive capacity, but because they're overwhelmed by poverty. Um, so if I if I reflect on this on this anecdote a little bit on the Riachuelo Basin, I have to ask what kind of adaptive capacity to floods can a family uh, have when they are living on a lot without a property title, lacking municipal connections to water and sanitation, and attending to their children and their own chronic sicknesses from environmental contaminants. So I'm very suspicious, if, you, if you've uh, seen this already in my, in my comments, of international discourses on adaptation without transformation, uh, when the focus is on who is vulnerable versus why they're vulnerable in the first place, because it's immense a preoccupation with technical fixes rather than redressing the sort of social, economic, and political exclusions that render communities vulnerable. Thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much. Um, I think I'll take uh, or give each of the panelists a chance to, um, to perhaps ask the others or make a comment on the others' presentations. But let me also just I guess, offer an observation or maybe a a question or two here. Uh, I think the situations that all the panelists describe are, are characterized by very, very difficult inferential problems. Uh, is this event occurring because of cause A, B, or C, or, or what combination of them? And at the same time, uh, there's the old adage of 
if everybody is responsible for something, nobody is responsible for it. So I think many of your remarks have emphasized that there are different levels of government and different levels of community organizations that could all be involved, but if all could be involved, how do we determine what the appropriate role of each is? So I guess I would toss that out as sort of a general thought about trying to sort out some of these issues and, and then ask if the panelists have any remarks um, sparked by that observation or by what you heard from each other. Dr. Huck, I'd ask, invite you to go first if you have any follow-on remarks. Yes, thank you. Thank you, the other panelists. It's very interesting and uh, fascinating discussion by both uh, Sarabhan Tohura and also Teresa. I just uh, have an observation or maybe question to also Teresa that uh, the Argentinian experience that uh, she shared that uh, has many commonalities with uh, many of the other parts of the developing countries. Uh, the overall issue that you raised that the vulnerability uh, the causes of vulnerability is uh, probably very important to uh, raise this question and uh, rather than explaining it in detail. Uh, but my just uh, just a curiosity because I'm not very aware about the uh, South American situation. So uh, what's the role that in case of uh, Bangladesh, you could just have in comparison that what role that uh, this uh, local level of organizations, this, uh, whether it is uh, NGOs or voluntary organization, charge-based organization, or the local government, do they play during the specific kind of a disaster, uh, for example, in Argentina? Um, sorry, during the during uh, the floods or during the ongoing contamination? I think in the flood, probably that will be more comparable the situation in Bangladesh uh, for us, since we are discussing the flood in Bangladesh. Yeah, so, so um, uh, there isn't, um, okay, so, so this, one of, the, one of the tricky parts of this area is the multi-jurisdictionality of it, that there's, it's an overlay of competences. And so it's always somebody else's responsibility. Um, so NGOs, um, I think that, um, uh, I think that somebody said before, it's sort of a reactive uh, response to, uh, to the additional, um, you know, the additional uh, 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 experiences that come with climate change events. But uh, NGOs tend to be reactive in the best way they can, and governments tend to be reactive, either, either the, the, um, the provincial government or the, um, uh, or the municipal governments tend to be reactive. There isn't um, it, it, there isn't a network of NGOs or a com there's a lot of community based activism around uh, trying to uh, trying to um, point out to to monitor and to um, to bring to light the contamination, but the uh, but there isn't a, a real network of community level organizations that are helping, um, you know, survive each, uh, each climate event. I'm not sure if I'm actually answering your question. Ms. Zaman, would you like to uh, add any further observations before we open it up for the participants for Q&A? Um, I do have a question uh, for uh, two of our distinguished panelists. Um, I mean, if we take uh, this year's flooding situation, uh, at as uh, many of we are aware that this year in South Asia, we had experienced the uh, devastating flooding situation. Uh, and uh, it was um, it, it was so devastating and uh, caused so much uh, damages to the local community as a whole that um, uh, we never experienced it before. So besides adaptation, I would um, uh, request to comments to panelists, uh, how do you see it from the context of loss and damage? Because uh, due to the, the adverse impact of climate change, uh, the frequency and intensity of the flooding situation is getting um, 
adverse over the time. And uh, this is the situation we cannot actually address this through adaptation. So from the context of loss and damage, how do you see the situation or uh, whether do you see any scope for, um, uh, I mean, compensation and uh, liability uh, perspective? Uh, can I answer? Okay. Yes, I, I think uh, as even our uh, survey also state that uh, mitigation is still is a far-fetching a distant kind of a idea, not only to the people who have been affected, but even to the government people also that uh, at the local level. It's still this uh, loss and damage is a very macro level, centralized, uh, only probably few ministries are now talking about, even in case of Bangladesh, when we were taking interviews, a very interesting interviews that Todd and I were taking interviews of the meteorological department officials, even they were <laughs> saying that they were not quite sure that climate change is happening. But they were just telling something opposite that Ministry of Environment was saying, and they were saying that the scientific data is still is not enough there. So this whole concept of uh, this, uh, the loss and damage is uh, still at a very centralized macro level discussion. I don't see it's coming down in near future because in developing countries, we always work on an ad hoc basis. We always try to kind of uh, solve the immediate problem. That's the nat natural kind of a thing because we have uh, shortage of resources. Uh, so we, uh, we are always in troubleshooting and uh, fixing things. So from that point of view, uh, even the politicians are uh, also in that mindset because they don't have a long-term view. Even we, our policies are not at uh, that point. So even though I fully agree with you, this is a, a kind of a mitigation issue rather than only uh, adaptation. And uh, this will not help at, at the end. And we have seen in our survey when Todd and I uh, visited different parts of Bangladesh and in Kutubia, the island, that there's uh, embankments and other things are so uh, short lived that even the infrastructure is so weak and it's because of corruption and other things. And because the sea level is rising and we are seeing it. But uh, uh, the policy level, this uh, uh, lack of awareness or uh, intentional uh, kind of unwillingness still been there. So that's the reality. Yeah. Uh, Professor Kramers, did you uh, want to ask another question? I do. I, I was really interested in the survey um, that uh, you presented, Dr. Huck. I'm, um, I'm wondering how respondents or how you um, and your and your colleagues had thought about the difference between responsibility and answerability. So whether um, respondents as whether respondents assumed, you know, whoever is responsible for this risk or this damage uh, are also answerable uh, or, or whether there were different ideas about who was, um, you know, who had an obligation to, to sort of justify their actions. Um, and who had and who were the ones affected who could evaluate and sanction those uh, those authorities? Do you know? I'm, I'm just trying to see how how uh, the response the respondents disaggregated and perhaps how your study set this up. Uh, I'm, I'm mute, please. <laughs> uh, I think that Todd can also answer this question. Todd, do you want to answer? because uh, he is a co-author of uh, our paper, so you can unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself, Todd. Oh, I, okay, so please go ahead if I, I'm, I'll, I'll add in if you, if you want, all right. Okay, okay, so I think this, uh, uh, we have a very fascinating kind of a question here, and we really, I, I couldn't explain more details, the whole question of this responsible, the first if I address this responsible issues that, uh, so this was a direct question related with the government's level, and then also the religious, the religion, and so also the science kind, kind of question. So there was a different variety of questions about the whole responsibility issue. Is it science or is it a religion or is God or is a local government or the, 
international organizations, US or the big countries. So these uh, answers are uh, like, as you said, that the respondents could not differentiate. So that's a kind of a little bit frustrating for us. Uh, if I can only talk about data. I cannot give my own opinion or the other research, but this in this survey, the respondents could not differentiate uh, between local central government or the international level. And also they could differentiate between science and religion. And the people who, who thought that the science is the, is the answer and the, this is a scientific reason, not the religion, they have a different opinion in terms of accountability that I showed there, that they think that the government should be more accountable. They want to make them more accountable. Uh, but uh, other than that, we could not make differentiate between uh, uh, the different levels of accountability. The uh, other uh, answer of your question is uh, the general accountability issue. The people still think that uh, at the local level that uh, the central government should be more accountable, even though the projects are being implemented by the local government, but they blame everything for the central government for any failure. Even though they know that the local government is sometimes doing corruption, they are not doing good work in terms of building embankments and other things. But then when it comes to the question of accountability, they want to blame, and that's basically understandable because the local government officials, they always um, make this blame game. They say that, okay, we cannot do enough for you because the central government giving is not giving us enough resources. So it's not our fault, even though they are doing also corruption. So. This is a kind of a blame game and people, because since, since they see the local government officials side by side, visibly them, that's why they're a little bit more probably friendly to the local government than the central government. So do you want to add anything? Sure, sure, thanks. I mean, I, I think that the first thing to emphasize is that as, uh, as Professor Zaman says, um, you know, the, the lack of differentiation among the public reduces the ability to gain accountability to begin with, right? I mean, I think as, as, uh, as Dr. Hawk pointed out, you know, a lot of people didn't really even know the difference between adaptation and mitigation. And frankly, some of our respondents, close to half, had never even heard formally of climate change per se. They knew about, uh, obviously, about all of the disasters, but they didn't, they didn't accumulate them in their experience into a concept of climate change. So that's, I think, the very beginning of a, of a difficulty that, uh, that would exist in gaining accountability. But I also believe that people had a comfort with the local government that they didn't have with the central government. And I think that also um, the international community, as, uh, as, as Taufik pointed out, was sort of uh, a distant consideration. That is that people really address what is happening in their local government and what they've heard from local government officials rather than even really considering what happens nationally and even more remote and more distant and far away from them is the international. I, I think that was very clearly spelled out in the survey and it, it, it made it in some regards difficult to interpret more specifically some of these results. And I think that uh, Dr. Kremers discussion of responsibility versus answerability is, is a very enlightened way to think about this question. I don't think it's one we can tease out of this survey. I mean, I, I think we don't have the information. Part of it may be the questions we ask, but I think beyond that, it's the difference or the lack of awareness of many of the respondents about the particularities of who is responsible. And I think, uh, Dr. Simpson's point about if everyone is responsible, no one is, I think also comes into play. And I think the, the issue of polycentrism is um, where each level of government has a certain responsibility to solve this collective action problem. And in this case, climate change, um, I think is, is a problem when the citizenry is not sufficiently well informed as was the case in, in Bangladesh and frankly, we're seeing it in a lot of other countries and, and perhaps with the climate issue, we may be seeing in the United States in part these days as votes are counted in the presidential election. I think that's a excellent segue for one of the questions I'd like to bring up that uh, participants offered. And before I begin the participant questions, I think in the interest of efficiency, I will just try to summarize what you've put into the Q&A. Uh, please feel free, participants, to add additional questions to the Q&A. 
but the first is, I believe, from Naomi Hassein, who thanks the presenters for their very inter interesting presentations. But, uh, and I think this is very appropriate given that we've talked about the lack of, of information awareness. But she says, it's tempting to think that the lack of awareness is the problem, that more information would enable citizens to hold government accountable. But she adds, there's no reason to believe it would. Many people have a lot of information about climate change in the US, for example, and refuse to believe it. So information does not make accountability. So her question is, do panelists believe that political competition has been important in driving accountability for flood action? And maybe we should expand that to other environmental problems as well. And if so, what can we expect in a single party state? So if anyone would like to take that question, please, uh, please unmute and jump in. Uh, if I, uh, yeah, I, I saw the question. Thank you, Professor Naomi, and a very, very uh, thought-provoking question. Yeah, I fully agree with her. I think, I think the political competition is a primary, can be a primary tool to ensure accountability. And, and local government is, uh, in a way, a little bit more accountable in case of Bangladesh now because uh, the local government officials are still very directly elected by the, uh, by the general people. The local government elections are more or less happening, even though the quality of elections, there are questions. But uh, in Bangladesh, as I do understand, Professor Naomi is uh, hinting that Bangladesh is heading towards one party system. And that's basically will be creating uh, more challenges in terms of uh, ensuring accountability for the central government level. So I fully agree that uh, uh, the, the two points, the awareness will not solve all the problems. Yes, information is necessary, but even having it, after having information, people still will not be able to ask questions or make institutions accountable if that uh, culture of democracy is not there. And also if uh, we don't have political competition, there is also a possibility that uh, we will see less accountability mechanisms in working. Uh, and in case of Bangladesh, as I say, the local government is still a little bit more accountable because they are still some democracy has been practiced there and uh, people know that uh, this the elected representatives, they know that if during the flood, if they don't uh, help the general people in the next election, they will change them. So they, that fear basically works. So they are fully agree with that. Thank you. Anyone else like to jump could in I, on that? Could I, could I ask a question maybe? What, what counts as, because accountability is a relational concept, right? It's about political claim making and at least, you know, in the public uh, sphere, public accountability is about political claim making by stakeholders and, and uh, public uh, responsiveness to, uh, to, to these uh, claims. But what counts as having made the political claim. Must, must a community frame its damages in terms of climate change, mitigation, adaptation, resilience, or you know, what, what would count as, because I note that you say, well, that there's not even a discussion of climate change. There's no awareness of these damages uh, being suffered or attached to climate change. So, it, to, to, to what extent is the onus of responsibility on the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the victims to frame the political claim in a context in which um, you know, the international community can say, aha, uh -huh, now, you're, now you're speaking the right way. Um, and, and just as a little uh, concerned about uh, um, uh, you know, political claims only counting as such if they're framed in a way that is uh, translatable to an audience um, beyond the, the immediate community. I, I, don't, I guess I'm posing that question openly, uh, perhaps to Naomi, perhaps to uh, my fellow panelists. Can I answer or I don't know Please. anyone else? Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I do. I, I do understand this. The whole uh, issue of the framing the claim issue that who is responsible and who is not. Uh, but I'm a little bit, uh, little bit pessimistic about this whole uh, loss and damage, uh, loss and damage kind of a claim, and also the uh, making the international community 
accountable at this point of the time of uh, global uh, situation. So as we are discussing before this uh, thing uh, today, the official US uh, withdraw from uh, Paris climate change uh, agreement and then uh, Trump, if he wins this election, we will be seeing a real challenge of multilateralism. The international institutions probably will be becoming more weaker in the next four years. So I don't see any point that the national governments in Bangladesh or in Argentina or in India uh, just spending their energy just to ensure that this uh, loss and damage kind of a claim. Or uh, I don't I don't see any much benefit out of it. Rather than it's more important that if the governments can think more about how they can make sure that they are more becoming accountable at the local level to ensuring that. Uh, climate change related projects so that we are seeing in Bangladesh, huge uh, hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent and there are corruption charges. So if it is, can be so if the accountability can be ensured at the local and national level, at least not at the international level, I, if possible, that's fine. If not, and still, I think that would be a big change even in the next few years that uh, at least accountability and uh, this responsibility issues, if they been taken care by the national and local government. Uh, I do understand the broader uh, picture and also the uh, ide idealistic uh, positioning of uh, identifying the, the main culprit of climate change. That's also important. That should that work needs to be continued, but in the meantime, we need to also focus more on the micro level. Thank you. Um, let me ask uh, do we have time for another question? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm having a little difficulty reading it, so I'm going to have to expand my screen. But Michael Steckler asks, um, riverine floods affect northern Bangladesh and depend mostly on upstream rainfall. Difficult to attribute individual events to climate change, only the emergence of changes in frequency. Uh, let me just try to summarize the question. Uh, it's difficult to directly attribute events to climate change, of course, and uh, we see a slow increase in vulnerability. So are there reasonable, uh, or sorry, are there regional differences in perception of climate change? Uh, and maybe the, the most important question he asks here is, could climate change simply be a scapegoat for poor local or national government management? Is it a way for the government to get off the hook by saying it's it's just a global phenomenon that we can't do anything about? But in case of Bangladesh, is uh, the government policymakers are not using the word climate change much at the national or local level politics. They are only bringing the climate change issue in the international forum when they are our ministers and policymakers going to Paris, uh, uh, Paris. Uh, uh, agreement uh, meetings or other climate change related meetings, then they are raising. But at the, uh, you will not find that Bangladesh policymakers are blaming climate change for uh, flight. No, that's not the case. Uh, I think uh, the question is also very valid. Yes, in case of uh, in the northern uh, uh, kind of a flood, uh, Bangladesh has a lower riparian, riparian country. Uh, the, the, the rivers are coming also from India and China. And sometimes because they are opening their uh, rivers, their Swiss gates, the uh, flood is happening and we are having a serious problem with the river management with India, especially with Pista and some other rivers. So these are also a kind of a man-made flood in some way. And uh, also it's a question of broader inter, uh, a kind of a interstate uh, water management issue rather than climate change. So I fully agree that all floods are not related with climate change. And also, so these are genuine concerns, but uh, there are also uh, concerns that uh, sea level rising is a big concern for Bangladesh. Salinity is a big concern for Bangladesh. Many parts of Bangladesh in the southern part already been salinated because of the uh, sea level is rising and the crops have been affected. Uh, we are having a temperature changing in the last few decades. So I think there are genuine concerns from climate change scientific point of uh, explanation. But also there are some other issues related with flood and other natural disasters which are not directly related to climate change. Thank you. Uh, please, uh, Ms. Martin, go ahead 
briefly, I think we're getting close to time though, so if you could just uh, quickly pull up. So uh, briefly, I will try to actually address the uh, current um, question and also the previous question that asked by Teresa regarding the accountability issue and also the issue of uh, climate change and the attribution problem. Um, uh, in that uh, context, I would uh, just like to say there are very recent development uh, in the matter of climate litigation. Um, uh, I think uh, uh, Victoria some might relate it in Canada. There was a case filed um, uh, by the uh, indigenous community, though it didn't succeed. But later uh, in uh, Netherlands, um, there was a case filed by the, uh, and it was called uh, Argenta case, where the government, Netherlands government was held accountable for not taking adequate action to address the climate change issues. So from the Paris Agreement perspective, even from Bangladesh context, because under the Paris Agreement, Bangladesh government by itself, they took a commitment, a promise, uh, to take adequate action to address the climate change issues. So from that context, even Bangladesh government, um, as we are party of Paris Agreement, we cannot actually deny our accountability. We cannot deny for not taking adequate action. And in that case, we, uh, I mean, if we see the current development of climate litigation stuff, then we can definitely think about to go to the court uh, and to ask the government that why they are not taking adequate action, because this is the promise that Bangladesh government submitted to under the Paris Agreement and also uh, many other countries, uh, the promise that they took by themselves and also in many countries i think also in usa us also preparing um, for a climate litigation uh, to hold the government accountable so um, this is the development and um, these are the context as well where actually the government can be held accountable and cannot be bypassed um, their obligation at the national level okay thank you very much and thank you to all our presenters for what's really been a a fascinating session and thank you very much to the participants for uh, coming in and listening and asking questions. So I'll just uh, turn this over to Professor Eisenstadt in closing and ask if he has any remarks or uh, I'm sure he'll want to fill us in on other interesting events in this series. Well, thank you so much just to uh, again thank our panelists and appreciate the, the great work that that is being done. And, and hope that that work continues um, also in the US where, where on behalf of the uh, Center for Environmental Policy and the School of Public Affairs, we thank you for attending and just remind you that on uh, November 18th at 1 p.m. Uh, will be our next presentation. So thank you again and um, have a wonderful day and thank you panelists